go under in a specific way, dare one say specific to the object, Captain Ahab and Moby Dick. Literary example. Okay? So therefore, I come back to the beginning. The time for doing this kind of a thing is the bad time. Because one lives in the bad time. One looks forward to getting cut the day after. I quote now. The movements of deconstruction do not shake a structure in its entirety respectfully from the outside. You can't destroy fascism from the outside as a structure. They are not possible and effective, the movements of deconstruction, nor can they aim and adjust their strike except by inhabiting those structures, inhabiting them in a certain way because one always inhabits and all the more when one does not suspect it. So this is a kind of self-conscious inhabiting rather than saying, hey, man, look, no hands. Operating necessarily from the inside, borrowing all the strategic and economic resources of subversion from the old structure, borrowing them structurally, that is to say, without being able to isolate their elements and atoms, the enterprise of deconstruction always in a certain way is swept away by its own work. In a, though the important phrase is in a certain way. This is what the Terry Eagletons of the world do not understand. Okay, this is the end of this quote. What strikes the reader again and again is the responsibility of the critic. You cannot shake up the whole thing from the outside in its entirety, and you cannot separate the tiny bits from the inside either. Work at working as your object, the thing that developed later into être juste avec, but not quite as, for you live in it, but the resources are still borrowed. So you're living unauthorized, which implies a certain degree of separation or caution, which might imply a self-consciousness perhaps, but this self-consciousness must be prepared to be carried off by its own intimate risk-taking. What is this being carried away? How to distinguish it either from falling back within or pushing away without? Is this the distance between the italics of self-consciousness in the first, in a certain way, in the passage, and their absence in the being carried away of self-consciousness the, at the end of this passage? It's kind of Nietzschean typography. Now, Remember, this is not about personal details. This is not about Marx, uh, as a spy said, lying drunk in the sofa and then suddenly jumping up and going to G7 in the British Museum. That's not what we are talking about. We are, it, it, I am talking about the fact that when Marx writes that in order to counter capital, he has to take the methods of capital, the reason why obviously thought he loved capital too much. This kind of thing, so is that, what it, is that the, the certain way? The, um, all these are practical questions about reading and the limits of reading. I've also always liked the word ancien in that thing, old structures. I know it can be made to mean simply pre-existing. Remember at, the, um, at the, the seminar we were, I was commenting on the emphasis on the part of my uh, race gender marked friends in the thing. I was. Uh, commenting on their emphasis on the British 19th century, the German 18th century, and so on and so forth. Ancien. Uh -huh. So I know it can be made to mean simply pre existing or prior, but I like to think that this is an indication of Derrida's engagement with the classics. If the first passage is about the responsibility of reading, the second passage is about the transactional character of writing, and I quote, the constitu by the way, the translation is altogether modified. What did I know? I was a young person. The uh, constitution of a science or philosophy of writing is a necessary and difficult task. But a thought of the trace without closure, of difference or of reserve or of historical closure, are in, must in fact posit itself in the field of the episteme, my historical closure. So the thought of the historical closure being open, Derrida wrote this a lot later also, in terms of where he's coming from. It, might, it can, although it's the thought of the trace, and it's the thought of the 
of the of difference, it must posit itself in the field of the episteme, my own historical closure, the way I think, my mindset, mindset. Outside of the economic and strategic reference to the name that Heidegger justifies himself in giving to an analogous but not identical transgression of all philosophies, thought is here for us a perfectly neutral name, a textual blank, the necessarily indeterminate index of an epoch to come. In a certain way, thought means nothing. In a certain way. That's what I was talking about today when I quoted Kutsia's line at the end of Waiting for the Barbarians. Something stares me in the face and I cannot see what it is. So that the idea of being able to work for what Nietzsche called the philosophers of the future, people who will not resemble you, and people who will draw meanings out of what you're doing now, which you may not, in fact, be able to articulate right now. That's what he's talking about. The language, of course, for em empiricists, for people who don't like this kind of poetic stuff, will seem irresponsible. But try a little bit to be unlike yourselves. So thought means nothing in that sense. Like all openings, this index belongs by the face that is open to view within a past epoch. So you are in a time which is for the future past and you're pointing toward. That's how this consortial thing with tactical, as Peter was saying, tactical interventions with, uh, with uh, uh, faculty who will not all come from a similarly thinking group and also expand it in various ways. That's how it can, in fact, articulate the limits of what it does. Thought, uh, thought has thought weighs nothing. See, I'm modifying the modifying the thing I, I had written in my translation. Thought has no weight. That is not so. This thought weighs nothing, pairs rien, like the Malarmean idea. The rien is a thing articulated by the text. So it may be that it's nothing for me listening to the Londoners. Remember how I was? But it's not nothing. It, you see, it's, it moves. So thought weighs, this thought weighs nothing. It is the play of the system, that very thing which always weighs nothing. It continues to weigh this damn thing that's going to travel, that's a nothing. It's not tied to your market predicaments. Thinking is what we already know that it has not yet begun. So in that sense, he's saying that I've made so many translation modifications, I can hardly read it. So the grammatology, this thought, would still be walled in within presence, and with the writing is its name only in this historical closure. So he undoes these things. We have to remember that the trace difference reserve thought carries the name uh, nothing, jamais ne pèse rien, writing to do in the general sense only in this historical episteme, and so on. But this passage speaks to me also because it is about writing in one specific narrow sense, considering the question, what is it to write here now? Does writing carry the question, what is it to write? Does writing carry anything? Does it carry thought? Only weightlessly, for in the system that can be writing, thought always weighs nothing because it looks to the future when it will differ from itself and be inhabited knowingly or unknowingly by another reader, thinker, and so on indefinitely. Am I empiricizing? Am I wrong in thinking this way? That, but that I believe that this can pass because empiricizing is implicit in this kind of writing. Writing is not only making meaning in a sign system, but also pointing like a trace if we keep up with, quote, writing in a general sense. So we get to do the limits of the historical get to the limits of the historical closure and do a consortium if you like, and we fall in, pointing at the way out as the event escapes into some future, some future anterior, and that's not just male hysteria. That's that kind of I mean that's that article. That's that kind of cheap use of psychoanalytic vocabulary. I mean that's psychoanalytic vocabulary is a more more tight thing. So it.